And now, the Trumpet Daily with Stephen Flurry. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. We're off and running on another program. Thanks to uh, Richard Palmer for filling in yesterday, the first day of classes. We were uh, hard at work on this end, trying to get everything up and running for uh, a new class we have on uh, a survey of Winston uh, Churchill's life. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the program if I have some time. But I can tell already, even though it's the, just the first class, that uh, there's too much material. We're not going to be able to squeeze it all in. But uh, it's going to be a fun study. And uh, it's nice to see the students uh, excited about that. And all the other classes, we had our first assembly yesterday, a, an address uh, that I gave to the entire student body. So that was exciting to see everyone come together and to talk about the subject of uh, unity and, and the foundation of God's love that holds everything uh, together. So uh, we're off to a good start here at Armstrong uh, College. On today's program, I, uh, Richard sent me an article this morning, uh, and it's pretty amazing when you just compare and contrast he, uh, it's this article at The Federalist by a professor who is talking about uh, the problem of, of screen addiction. All these young people coming from uh, wherever they come from, paying tens of thousands of dollars to attend these prestigious universities. And then they go into these, uh, these classrooms, and these professors are there giving lectures, trying to teach them. And uh, so many of them, more and more of them, they're just uh, hooked into their phone. Their phone. <laughs> they're, they're paying for this, this big university education, and they can't pull away from their device. So we'll look at uh, that professor's uh, article, some of the observations that's he, that he's made um, about young people at, at the university today. We'll get into that in the next uh, segment. But first, we'll uh, discuss some of the, the news items uh, William Barr, as I played for you on the program uh, the other day, I guess it would have been Tuesday's show, he was commenting on the serious irregularities in the Jeffrey uh, Epstein case, uh, the billionaire who committed suicide. He was trafficking all of those uh, teenage girls, sex tra trafficking them, and then uh, uh, mysteriously committed suicide on Saturday morning, and this is from Fox News today. It says, Jeffrey Epstein uh, aut autopsy reveals broken bones in neck, and the article says, an autopsy on the body of Jeffrey Epstein revealed the convicted sex offender had several broken bones in his neck, including the hyoid bone, according to a report. It says the hyoid, bo the hyoid bone, which is near the Adam's apple, can be broken in suicide by hanging, especially in older people, but is more common in strangulation murders, the Washington Post reported. So this is from the Washington Post. And, of course, the, the report I'm reading from is Fox News. It says Epstein, uh, 66, was found hanging in his cell in an apparent suicide, it has in quotes, um, at the Metropolitan Correctional Center in New York City on Saturday where he was being held on these, these sex trafficking charges. It says he was placed on suicide watch in July, but was removed from it by the end of the month. Guards at the facility are suspected of falsifying log entries to make it look like they were checking on Epstein uh, more with, uh, with more regularity than they were, as surveillance video suggested the checks weren't done as scheduled. <laughs> so the attorney general was right. There definitely are some serious irregularities here. It says, per protocol, guards were supposed to check on him every 30 minutes, but the video reportedly showed uh, some guards didn't, didn't uh, do so for up to three hours, even falling asleep on duty. It says the Justice Department on Tuesday said that uh, two guards assigned to watch Epstein have been placed on administrative leave, and uh, Attorney General William Barr is demanding a thorough uh, investigation. So they're looking into all of these these uh, serious irregularities. Now we'll, I guess, learn later if there's any foul play here. But just think about when when the lid is lifted off. I was thinking about a prophecy in Ezekiel eight when just skimming through some of these headlines today. 
Whether or not there's foul play here, we don't know. But how much corruption is going to be fully and finally revealed at the return of Jesus Christ? We've been with with, uh, looking into the deep state and some of the things that have been coming out in the last couple of years. Uh, You see some of it being revealed already. Corruption at the highest levels of government. And, of course, we keep referring back to uh, Isaiah 1 and the sickness that's prophesied from head to toe. But that prophecy in Ezekiel 8, the prophet's looking at all the abominations going on in, in our nations. And God says, well, actually, take a closer look. You know, here's a little hole in the wall. Look in, look in this hole and see what's actually going on on the inside. The corruption through and through, sickness, disease, spiritually speaking, cancer. It's spreading. It's spreading all across society. This is just one particular news item, and there's so many. Look at the uh, news out of Philadelphia yesterday. These policemen coming under attack, just trying to do their job just trying to keep drugs and, and violence from spiraling out of control. Well, as they're trying to do their job, they end up in a standoff, and six of them, six of the police officers, were shot. It's nothing short of a miracle that we didn't have multiple office officers killed today, said the Philadelphia uh, police commissioner. So here were the Philadelphia policemen being shot up. And you know, did you know there were crowds around that crime scene that were actually laughing at the cops, laughing at the policemen, cheering on the thug? This is in Philadelphia. There was a CBS reporter there. She was shocked. She was reporting for her local outlet that crowds of people were laughing and yelling at the police officers. Just having a good time as police officers in Philadelphia were being shot. Meanwhile, you look at other reports regarding the police in the United States and how difficult that job is and just the increase in in suicides among police officers. There's some stats, some disturbing stats coming out of New York City. I guess the total number of suicides for the NYPD this year, it's uh, at eight already. And typically there's, I guess, four or five suicides annually. But that's on the rise. And you have more and more studies and surveys showing that The police don't really think the public appreciate them. And that's not much of a surprise, or at least it shouldn't be. According to a 2016 Pew survey of American policemen, only 13% believe that the public understands the risks and the challenges that law enforcement officers face on the job. More than 75% of officers believe that the media treat the police unfairly 75 percent well you can remember uh at the trumpet it was on our cover three or four years ago the police coming under attack and that hasn't gone away with the new administration in the white house as we saw yesterday here they are being shot up and people on the streets just laughing and having a good time as they're watching policemen being shot. This says instances of police misconduct exist, of course, and they justifiably lead to public scrutiny and condemnation, but we should resist the tendency to allow those events to shape how we view police more broadly. Those instances, they're rare instances of, of police misconduct, What about the tens of thousands of others who are just out there trying to do their job, like those policemen in Philadelphia yesterday? 
You contrast what's happening in some of the cities of America. Well, contrast it with Hong Kong. Richard talked about uh, Hong Kong yesterday on the program. And here they're, they're, people are surprised, commentators are surprised at the erosion of freedom in Hong Kong. Why should they be surprised? Ever since Britain gave it up, that was back in 1997, we've seen this continual erosion of freedom in that little province. Freedom is coming under threat now, and that's why these protesters over there are taking to the streets. Now, some of those protesters are flag, they're flying the American flag. They're flying the flag that to them represents freedom. In the United States, there's lots of people that take a, they take a knee during the national anthem. They denigrate the U.S. flag. There, there have been some placards over in Hong Kong saying that we need a second amendment <laughs> as they see as they see this massive country, this communist nation, China, squeezing the freedom out of Hong Kong. Some of them are calling for a Second Amendment. They want some protection from that communist beast. Well, you heard some on the program yesterday about the demonstrations, which are, which are becoming more more violent clashes between these anti-government uh, protesters and uh, the government. It started out peaceful enough, I suppose, a few weeks ago. But it's been intensifying. This is from ABC. It says, after weeks of issuing warnings, but deferring to Hong Kong authorities to quell protests, Beijing has hinted at, more assert- at a more assertive uh, posture It says Chinese paramilitary police were seen in video released by the state holding exercises in uh, Shenzhen, China, which sits across the border from Hong Kong. Images circulated online showing a convoy of armored personnel carriers from the People's Armed Police traveling to the site. So you've seen a difference even in the way the state media in China is reporting this. Initially, of course, they just tried to ignore it, cover it up, but they can't ignore it anymore. So now they're, they're putting the protesters in a very negative light. In other words, it, a, a strong crackdown on these protesters in the view of Beijing. It's justified. That's where this is leading. From the Times in England, it says the rapid revolution sorry, the rapid evolution of uh, Chinese propaganda about Hong Kong is is just cause for concern. As the protests have grown into popular revolt, it has shifted from a complete blackout of peaceful protests to focus exclusively on violence, rioting and warnings of, of, of the black hand of American interference. It says there are calls for direct elections, which go well beyond the freedoms, now under threat, which were guaranteed to Hong Kong on its handover from Britain to China in 1997. Britain said, you know, you know the story there. I'll, I'll go to the trumpet in just a second. But Britain, of course, embarrassed by its history, wanting to offload all of the, the possessions of the empire of old, and so they hand it over, but of course, they had to get some assurances from China. Now, if we hand over Hong Kong, you have to make sure that you let them maintain their freedom. Make sure that that, that capitalist society continues to exist. And China at the time said, well, of course, of course we'll do that. We're not going to upset anything. That was back in 1997. This article at the time says Beijing is caught faced with a a protest movement in 2014. Hong Kong's Beijing-backed leaders waged a war of attrition that put a lid on unrest until this year. A similar effort is underway now with scores of protesters facing up to 10 years in jail on colonial-era charges of rioting. It's not clear. It's not clear that the authorities will stop there. It says the picture 
state media is painting to mainlanders has the hallmarks of, a, of the ground being laid to justify an intervention. So you watch China as it continues its crackdown. The people are upset. It's this uh, extradition bill that's stripping them of their freedoms, basically. And now, like that article says, they're calling on free election or direct elections. It's quite a confrontation between this former British colony, this Seagate, and communist China. What did we say at the time? This is an article by Ron Fraser, the late Ron Fraser, back in 1997 about the Hong Kong handover. And he talks about some of the history and Britain now wanting to to get rid of it. Well, that's happened. Mr. Fraser wrote, the terms of a treaty signed by Britain and China in 1984 stipulate that following the withdrawal of the British governor on June 30th, 1997, the whole of the territory of Hong Kong will revert to Chinese sovereignty, becoming what is described as the as a special administrative region. China has agreed to keep the present capitalist economic and social administrative systems in place for 50 years. So they're they're happy to just wait it out. It's not even looking now like that will hold that 50 year period. It's been, what, 22 years? But China was happy to agree to that back in 1997, or I guess going back to 1984 when the treaty was signed with Britain, because here you're, you're gaining this Seagate. And look at all that's been happening in the South China Sea since 1997 with Britain's removal from the region. Of course, the U.S. has downsized its forces in the area as well, and so you have China militarizing the South China Sea. And why should anyone be surprised by this? We, sh- we shouldn't even be surprised by what's happening in Hong Kong. The trumpet, back in 97, we said, with, with the end of the British rule in Hong Kong, we see a final act performed in the closure of an empire, a God-given empire, and the hastening of the fulfillment of the prophesied curses upon a spoiled and ungrateful nation, the British people. And he talks about how it was just given up basically for nothing. Mr. Fraser said, What hope has this old colonial territory in the hands of a government that is still a pariah in the eyes of those who tout for human rights from the free democratic West? Not only do population figures of mainland China overwhelm those of Hong Kong, but her internal political dynamics, corruption, cronyism, and shallow understanding of what makes Hong Kong tick are all set to undermine the economic miracle that has made Hong Kong what it is today. Mr. Fraser said, One has but to contrast the history of China over the past 150 years with that of Hong Kong to make a judgment on the territory's future under Chinese rule. That's what the trumpet was saying in 1997. Pretty amazing analysis there. Spot on. And then you see what's happening on the streets of Hong Kong today. The people, they know, they realize our freedoms are evaporating. And so they're taking to the streets. And the police are responding in heavy-handed fashion. Contrast that with Philadelphia. Here are six policemen, or more than that, I guess, just trying to remove a drug addict trying to get get rid of drugs, trying to get rid of violence, trying to get rid of crime. They're out doing their job. They're trying to preserve the freedoms that we enjoy. And people who don't appreciate that are there laughing and cheering. Cheering on the thug as he shoots down policemen. Welcome to the upside down world. My father, in that article from 19, no, this is 2016, China is steering the world toward war. He he mentioned the Hong Kong handover in that article from three years ago. 
My father said Britain actually gave the South China Sea Prize of Hong Kong to the People's Republic of China in 1997. Now that U.S. military presence in the area has been drastically reduced, China is claiming the entire South China Sea as its own. My father said whoever controls these vital sea gates controls one-third of the world's maritime commerce. Well, then he goes on to talk about the oncoming trade war and the U.S. and Britain being frozen out by these, these gigantic trade blocks in Asia, Europe, and elsewhere. It's interesting, though, he mentions the Hong Kong handover there because that was really the beginning of what we're seeing, what we're seeing happen in the South China Sea, what we're seeing happen with respect to the prophesied trade war, the Mart of Nations prophecy in Isaiah. It's an interesting look back, that trumpet article from June of 1997. Hong Kong handover is the title, A Sign of the Times. You're listening to Stephen Flurry, and this is the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. If you'd like to email the program, you can send comments to td at kpcg.fm. We'll be right back. This is KPCG-FM, and this is the Trumpet Daily. A turning point in recent history has gone almost entirely overlooked. Since that time, an unseen cause has brought about national and world troubles in unprecedented fashion. Crises are intensifying as never before. In our generation, we are seeing radical changes to culture, family, education, religion, science, finance, politics, international relations. Everything has been affected. You cannot understand events without recognizing this unseen cause. The United States has been shaken in astonishing fashion. Have you wondered why the world's number one superpower is declining so rapidly? Are you concerned about where the current administration is leading this country? The Bible provides penetrating insight into the invisible cause of society's decline. America is prophesied to fall before it rises again. The Bible also gives extraordinary insight into how that fall will come about. This insight puts the seriousness and urgency of current events in their true perspective. Understand what's in store for America and why. Visit thetrumpet.com and click on the literature tab to request this free enlightening booklet, America Under Attack. Trumpet Daily. I just noticed uh, at Fox News <clears throat> during the break, the uh, headline heckled under fire. They've got a story there at the top now about the uh, shooting in Philadelphia yesterday and the crowds cheering on the gunman. Well, switching over to this, uh, <clears throat> this Federalist piece, eight ways students' tech addiction is ruining college. It's ruining their, their college life, their college education. As I said at the top of the show, this is a piece by a, a professor. Uh, he teaches American government, and he's complaining in this piece about addiction to smartphones. He can't get the attention of his students. <clears throat> Every single one of them has a smartphone, he says. And every student is looking at that smartphone all the time, including during during class, he says. It's just impossible to break them away from it. He writes, several times I've stopped teaching and walked right up to a student engrossed in an online video, especially if he's wearing headphones. (laughs) It takes several awkward seconds before he notices me. Can you imagine that? Hear that kid's parents probably are paying thousands and thousands of dollars for him to go off to college. He shows up for his class, but he's got his headphones in and he's watching some movie on his phone. It's crazy. 
Well, it says this professor, last year he tried to make his class device free. He told them up front, you can't bring your device in to this class or you can't use your device. I don't, I don't think he had the authority to, ne to necessarily take them away. But he's had mixed uh, results from this. He tried to tell them up front so that they wouldn't take the class if they were going to come in and, uh, and uh, just watch their phone. In any event, this is, I think, what really stood out to me, these points that he gives. Because I, in my orientation lecture on Monday, I gave <laughs> several points to the students about uh, why they're here, the purpose for their education, what their educational aims are while they're at God's college. And what a contrast when you compare it to some of the points that this professor puts forward. One of them being that screens jeopardize learning. They actually take away from our ability to learn. He, he says the internet, of course, is a is a valuable research tool. There's no doubt about that. But what I've seen is that these young people, they use the Internet to be entertained. They're not using it to research or to study. It's just a, an excuse for entertainment, filling up on entertainment. And then he talks about the amount of money that goes into a college education the article says, sometimes a student will com uh, come to my office complaining about a D on a test after studying for five hours, and I only have to ask one question, where was your phone while you were studying? The student will smile sheepishly and acknowledge it's possible she might have gotten distracted. I try to be compassionate, but really, if her phone was right next to her, chiming and chirping, she probably studied for the undistracted equivalent of five minutes. <laughs> she wasn't really studying. She was just fooling herself. She was deceiving herself. He says here that screens sabotage social life. So you go off to college not only to learn in the classroom, but this is a chance, he says, to get to know your peers, to get to know other young people, to get to know other young people of like mind, to actually converse with or interact with human beings. And these devices take away from that. It says today classrooms are eerily quiet, even when full of students. Each student is absorbed in a solitary world. He says, it breaks my heart to see a handsome young guy next to a lovely young lady never even looking at each other. <laughs> they don't even talk to each other. Well, one of the points that we stressed on Monday at our orientation was that you're here at God's College to become socially balanced, to build the personality of a king, to be more and more like Jesus Christ. God the Father, become you therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. You think about all the activity. Well, we had a, a youth camp, as you know. We had that just a few weeks ago, and there's all kinds of physical activity. Well, there's no devices, for one, but then there's all kinds of physical activity. There's lots of Bible-based instruction. There's lots of fellowshipping. And there's lots of group activities, lots of group dating, lots of dancing, lots of socializing. They're kept so busy, Mr. Armstrong used to say, that they don't have time for mischief. <laughs> they don't have time to get in trouble. And they were all excited. I think that we worked in an extra period of dance right at the end of PYC. Just an extra hour at the end of a busy uh, day of activity. And uh, so many of them were laughing and cheering and clapping. We get another opportunity to spend time with each other. I read the other day from Revelation 1 and verse 6. 
where it says God has made us kings and priests. He's made us kings and priests, and so we have to develop the personality of a king. We're here to lead the world. We're here eventually to teach the world. We're here to communicate a message. And so, what a difference when you compare what this professor is contending with and with what happens at God's college. I nearly stepped on the devices yesterday at the assembly because I guess they, they all throw them into a box there at the, <laughs> the entrance to the assembly hall. And they were not on their phones. Their, their phones weren't near them. And I was speaking to, what was it, 80, 90 people? Very attentive as I talked about the subject of, of God's love and treating one another with love and honor and respect and not letting little petty differences divide us, giving each other the benefit of the doubt, reaching out to one another in love, in care and concern, and then I finished with an extra 10 minutes, and, and we had a lively discussion. Lots of wonderful feedback coming from our students. Some of the older ones talking about lessons they learned as freshmen and how that you can't jump to conclusions, for example. You can't just assume. You need to talk. I told them that, too. I said, look, if there's a dispute between you and one of your brothers... Go and settle it. That's what the Bible teaches. If you're on your way to make a sacrifice before the altar and you've got a problem with your brother, Jesus said, put down the sacrifice, put down the offering, and go back and settle the dispute. Talk about it. He says, screens stunt career growth. This is this pref professor's... Uh, opinion. He says, at college, instructors dedicate their lives to helping students succeed. Uh, mentors readily share hard-won advice, and scholars are willing to introduce students to their long life, their lifelong passions. Fellow students will also go on to become entrepreneurs, engineers, experts in their fields. College is the chance to make lifetime connections. He, he's talking here about how screen addiction it just interferes with all this. It stunts your career growth. It puts you on the slow track to success. Well, another one of the points I brought out yesterday, and this is being made at a small liberal arts college, unaccredited even. But I said, nevertheless, you're here. You young people are here at God's College to prepare for your career. You're here to prepare for it. How do we know an AC education helps you for your future career? We know this because Jesus said, I came to bring you abundant life. That's John 10 and verse 10. That we might have a more abundant life by living God's way. And then you go through the the wonderful passage there at the end of Matthew 6 about having a single focus, about putting your trust in God, and about seeking first the kingdom and, and God's righteousness. And then all these things, it says, this is a promise from Jesus, all the things, they'll be added unto you. Just learn to seek first God and his kingdom and his righteousness. Bring God into your priorities. Bring God into your career. And let God bless you. That's what our young people learn here at the college. This professor says that screens undermine physical health. Most Americans today are overweight, and obesity is a bigger killer than smoking. I wonder, could sitting on our back ends, to paraphrase what he says here, 
Could sitting on our back ends looking at screens all day have anything to do with this? Most universities have gyms and all kinds of outdoor facilities, not to mention parks in the wider community. It's time for students to get outside and go while their knees are young and pain-free. Get outside and go at the end of PYC. I said, remember, <laughs> I told the young people, remember the, the pattern here. Get up in the morning, get your prayer, get your Bible study in, and then go. And then move. And then be active. That's the way of life at God's youth camp. That's the way of life at God's college. I wish above all things that you prosper and be in good health. That's what the Apostle John wrote in his third epistle. I told the students on Monday, another reason you're here, another, another lesson to learn at God's college is to obey the laws of radiant health. We even talked about physical health and the benefits of a godly lifestyle, a physical lifestyle that's healthy, vibrant, energetic, Get out and use the facilities, this professor says, while your knees are young and pain-free. <laughs> be active while you can be. Take advantage of it. Well, he says screens also attack mental health. They attack mental health and they corrupt the soul. Those are the last two points that he makes. This professor says screens can corrupt your soul in two ways. The first way is obvious. He talks about pornography. But more subtly, even PG-rated online activity endangers inner life. Ever-present ever phones invade the quiet spaces between activities. The time otherwise spent waiting uh, and daydreaming and meditating and just doing nothing. The noise from screens, whether good, bad, or neutral, drowns out the still small voice of God. When we feel stressed, do we pause to think about why? Do we take the, the time to pray? Or do we distract ourselves with shiny online spectacles? Well, here's the preacher, <laughs> or rather the professor, becoming a little preachy. And good for him. It's a good point. Obviously, pornography, violent video games, those kinds of things we've talked about in recent weeks. We ought to shun those things. But what about just the, the amount of time? Like the girl that goes and says, hey, I, I got a D. How'd that happen? I, I studied five hours. Well, where was your phone? In fact, she studied five minutes. She fooled herself into believing she studied five hours. We don't want to fool ourselves into thinking we got in a really lengthy and fervent prayer session when we really didn't. Well, the first point that I made on Monday <clears throat> was that you young people, you students, are here to develop a sound mind. This professor says that screen and screen addiction corrupts the soul. We're here at God's college to develop a sound mind. God's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. And isn't it interesting, if you look at that powerful passage in Philippians 2, the one I just read there is 2 Timothy 1, 7. But in uh, Philippians 2, it says that we have to let the mind of Christ in. We have to let it in. We can't let other things crowd it out. If we're just filling up on so many of these other things, even PG-rated content, as that professor says, it may be that Christ has no room to get into your mind. Let the mind of Christ in. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. When we come back, we'll conclude today's show by talking a little bit about this new Churchill course that we've started.
at Armstrong College. You're listening to Stephen Fleury, and this is the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. The human mind is a wonder. It can produce marvelous developments in science and technology. But the stark record of history shows the same mind cannot solve problems like war, illiteracy, poverty, starvation. The rapid advancements have not advanced world peace and have not prevented the evils that ravage our modern world. Mankind has proven tremendous at working with matter, yet history and events currently at play show man a devastating failure working with his neighbor. These truths raise many vital questions. What is human nature? Where did it come from? Did God create evil in man? And why has the mind of man produced such incredible advancement on the one hand, and on the other has not prevented calamitous evils? The answers are revealed clearly in the Holy Bible. Do you know what it says? There is no denying that our time has become fiercely evil. Is it even possible to escape the clutch of these seemingly unsolvable problems? For the remarkable answer, request our free booklet, Human Nature, What Is It? from thetrumpet.com. This is KPCG FM, and this is the Trumpet Daily. Someone just sent me a, uh, an American thinker piece about schools today. Worse than ever, government schools after 35 years. And he was saying how thankful he is for Imperial Academy. And, uh, of course, I talked in the last segment about the blessing of God's college and how exciting it is for us to introduce um, a new course on Winston Churchill, uh, arguably the greatest figure of the 20th century. I think most would agree, certainly the greatest politician. But he was so much more than that. He was an author, a journalist. He was a famous painter by the end of his life. He was a, an artist. Of course, he was a prime minister twice, a famous statesman, a historian. And so, as I say, you go into it thinking, wow, a whole year we can cover the whole story. And right away I get into it and think, well, actually, it's going to be hard to squeeze it all in. We uh, debated back and forth on whether to use the William Manchester volumes, the two, ser- uh, the two book series that he wrote before he died. He didn't, he didn't live long enough to finish the third volume, unfortunately. But we debated about whether to use those two volumes, which are considerably better than the the third volume uh, that someone else helped him finish, or to just get a one-volume work that covers the whole story, like Andrew Roberts' book from last year, uh, Churchill. But anyway, we uh, opted to go with Manchester's two volumes at the last because this is something that my father really has emphasized. He feels like that Manchester um, captured the drama of Churchill's story and that he had the right focus in uh, his two volumes and that he understood that Churchill, just one man, saved Western civilization as we know it. And so as I was saying to the students yesterday, there's quite a few different reasons why we should take the time to study Winston Churchill over the course of a school year. I played for them this, uh, this clip put together by, oh, I I didn't bring the name of the outfit. I think it's the International Churchill Society or something, but this is basically, it's a two minute clip here of scholars weighing in on why 
uh, Churchill was so important, so significant in 20th century history. Here's clip one. Anyone alive today, and especially younger people in the 21st century, has to know that if it were not for Winston Churchill, there's a very good chance that Western civilization wouldn't exist. We could all be living in a totalitarian state where your opportunity in life is provided by simply your race, your background. He is within a, a category of people who supersede time and all eras. For what he did, for the way that he inspired people, nations. A man who lived for 90 years, a man who was a leader of his nation in, in high government position in both the cataclysmic events of the 20th century, World Wars I and II. You might like the fact that he was ambitious and in a hurry, very effective. Uh, you might like the fact that he was um, not exactly reverent about authority. The greatest political leader of the 20th century rose to that status precisely because he stuck to his convictions and precisely because his view of politics was not one of partisanship or cynicism. A man who won the Nobel Prize for Literature, but yet was a man who had a, a union card as a bricklayer. A man who rode in the cavalry charge uh, and then became a politician and a parliamentarian. He made mistakes, he led with his chin, got knocked down, picked himself up, got knocked down, picked himself up. A, a man who painted 535 canvases in his lifetime. He never let a, a, a minute go by that he wasn't enriching himself uh, and thereby others. If you like uh, courage, if you like eloquence, if you like commitment to principle, Churchill is a man who had those things. If my grandfather could look down and see what people say about him, how much they quote him, and how he is revered, I think, of course, he couldn't help but be pleased. But what he would really like would be, I think, for his father to look down to and to know that the son, who he always said would be a failure, had been such a success. Those are some uh, commentators, historians, scholars today that look upon uh, Churchill as uh, the signif significant figure, the key figure of the 20th century. A man who, as William Manchester rightly notes, uh, a man who saved Britain, he saved Western civilization as we know it to be today. There was this, I failed to get the, the website, but it's an article by um, a writer named Cole uh, Feeks. It's from earlier this year. It's on Churchill's character, a rigid daily schedule, and he has some comments in this piece about Manchester's work on Churchill. But first he says, how did Winston Churchill achieve so much? Today we see him as one of the great figures in history, but even in his 60s, in the wilderness years of the 1930s, his final reputation was not apparent. Not many politicians have been through the kind of uh, dormant season Churchill endured, only to come out the other side with even more success than they enjoyed the first time around. It says one key to his success was his rigidly observed daily schedule. And this is something that Manchester writes about at length uh, in the second volume. It's a fascinating, I think it's 20, 25 pages, where it talks about how rigid his daily schedule was, and he makes the point that people that saw him during the day went away, could, could go away from it thinking it was just kind of random, or that maybe it wasn't that busy when he's out in the, uh, you know, the mid-afternoon feeding the ducks, for example. But it was all very rigid, very much scheduled, up in the morning, breakfast in bed, reading the newspapers for two hours. Then the writing shift begins. There are all the social occasions to go with it, the lunch, the dinner, and so on, lots of dinner guests. But then writing, writing extending well into the night. But listen to what this, this uh, author says here. He's referring now to Manchester's work. It says, Churchill's routine and work ethic even when out of government, display in seed form many of the qualities he would call upon later. 
when he made history on the world stage. I'll always maintain that the most underrated parts of William Manchester's uh, uh, William Manchester's books, the most underrated parts are the prologues to the first two volumes, Visions of Glory, takes his story only that far, but the prologue begins with Manchester drawing back the curtain on the dire situation he faced in May 1940. It will give you goosebumps. We read that uh, introduction yesterday in class. The part that it was England's last chance and that there was such a man to save the nation in London. Very inspiring. But then this author says here, the prologue to Volume 2 alone, which covers 1932 to 1940, uh, begins in a more pedestrian vein. Manchester drops the reader off in 1932 on the front steps of tree-locked and silent Chartwell in the first olive moments of daylight, just as the servants are beginning to stir. In his small bedroom, the master sits bolt upright and yanks off his black satin sleep mask. He, not the son, determines when he will greet the new day. It says, from the bedroom of uh, Titian-haired daughter Sarah comes the most popular hit of the season, Night and Day, You're the One. As action mounts, it becomes obvious that, the only, that only the man described in the second prologue could be ready for the, the scene described in the first. And so this is someone who really appreciates the scene that Manchester drops us off in at the start of volume two. It says Churchill's bedroom, probably the smallest room in Chartwell, was designed strictly for sleeping and working a bed with his specially designed breakfast tray. For many years, regular visitors said they could still detect the faint whiff of his uh, cigars. And then he goes into the daily routine, getting up at eight, starting in with the breakfast, and then just pouring over uh, the newspapers. Well, some of it's kind of funny. Um, the dining, some of the things that he jo enjoyed eating, the, the bathing. He took two baths every day. <laughs> uh, so an unusual schedule, for sure, but very strict. It says Churchill's daily schedule reveals an essential principle for success. He knows how to get things done. It's tempting to say that he works hard when he is working and plays hard when he is playing, but that would be to miscategorize the nature of his work. He is one of the most productive men who ever lived, but he knows himself and how to get the most bang for his pound sterling. To achieve productivity, he operates by two principles. The first he learned from Napoleon, whose bust gazes across the desk in his study, strength of force in the most crucial places. The second is economy of effort. Economy of effort is one of Churchill's brilliant characteristics. His daily work in bed saves energy for later when he will often dictate from a stand-up desk. When traveling, he is even more economical. Never stand when you can sit down, he will advise a visitor. <laughs> so this goes against some of the, the uh, admonitions we're receiving today, those of us that sit too much and probably need to, to stand. In any event, it's a wonderful introduction to that second volume, one of my favorite sections. The, the first bit from volume one obviously gives you goosebumps as well. Uh, but you can see why we uh, opted for Manchester's version of that history when uh, deciding on a, uh, a book or a textbook for our new class. Well, that's all that we have time for on today's show. You're listening to Stephen Fleury, and this is the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. If you'd like to email the program, you can send comments to td at kpcg.fm. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>